want to share with you how does god want us to love him how does god want us to love you know so many things were going in my mind and i didn't know what to speak should i speak on the holy spirit which is my pet subject should i speak on the family which is my pet subject or should i speak something and the lord burdened my heart to speak on do my people love me with a contract love or a covenant love i was praying for a few last few months but i was you know when you pastor you meet with people you go to their homes you spend time with them listen to their problems listen to their challenges some of them one time they are so excited enthusiastic they are ready to die for the lord ready to do anything for the lord the next week you go to see them they are so discouraged so frustrated they want to leave everything and stay at home don't want to read the bible don't want to pray and sometimes so negative of things in their lives and i was began to ask god god you called us and you called us out of darkness unto light for a purpose you established us in the kingdom of god and i began to ask god how should we love you as a nation how should we love you as people of god and i was speaking a series you know i speak series in our church i was speaking this series and suddenly one sunday the fourth service the lord put this thought in the middle of the sermon i don't know why he put it he said tell your people next week whether they are loving god with a contract or with a covenant and as i began to meditate and think about it and as i was praying the whole week and as i began to study the scriptures about contract and covenant the more i read and the more i thought i began to realize the people of god today they have a contract with god than a covenant relationship with god because we live in a society which is full of contracts you go to a job you have to sign a contract you buy a house you sign a contract you you get a house on rent you sign a contract contract is part of your life what is contract contract is done when you don't trust the other party contract is when it is done when you don't trust the other party because one party falters you should know what to do next so today in marriages sometimes people have contracts not a covenant relationship a relationship with god is a contract it's not a covenant so what happens you give me i will love you if you answer my prayers i will walk with you so suddenly god takes you through a period of silence you know when you pray there are three answers god gives you number one is yes we all want yes and when he says yes we are so excited we say god i love you i will serve you i will give my life for you you are is no other god like you in heaven or earth because you have answered my prayer the second answer is wait a little the hardest part wait a little because he knows at that moment you are not ready for that answer because the blessing can become a curse in your life so he tells you wait he doesn't say no he says wait and during that waiting period god prepares you to receive the miracle so that you can understand in your life to honor the miracle worker rather than the miracle you know our problem is many times we go after the blessing than the blesser in our life In the early stages of our Christian life we go after the bless the blesser and when he blesses us the blessing becomes more important rather than the blesser and our relationship with God begins to die down so that a time God says wait and that waiting is the hardest part but there are times we want to give up at that time we want to let go you know i had a lady in our church 
from a Buddhist background lately. Each time she prayed, she got what she wanted. And I told sister, be careful. God is not a God who, give, who is a kill joy. God is not a God who will give you popcorn every day. My God will one day take you through crisis situations. God will take you. Why? To, for you in the midst of that crisis situation still to love him. Because God wants to love you in a relationship of covenant rather than contract. But she was always happy for receiving, not giving. And I came to, you know, when you're out of, as a pastor, when you're out of the church, only problems come. When you're in the church, problems don't come. Last few, two days back, she called me. And she said, Pastor, pray for me. I said, what? My husband lost 20 million rupees, dollars, 20 million dollars. He's a businessman in Africa. He lost on this business. Someone stole all his money. I said, sister, have you not heard what I've been telling you? I said, this is the time to love God. This is the time. She said, pastor, I don't feel like praying. I said, this is the time you need to pray. This is the time you need to seek God. I said, he will receive the money back. Because if they're stolen, he'll they'll find it. But my friends, remember, the waiting period is the hardest part. Covenant relationship will always be willing to wait. The contract relationship will never want to wait. The third answer is no. It's also your answer. Don't parents tell the children no? Why do they say no? Because they know the child is not ready to receive what he's asking. He's not mature enough. You don't give small children knives to play because you know you give a knife to a child, the child will cut himself. You know, my grandchildren, we have good times together. And sometimes one of my grandsons, he, he asks, you have to give. And what I do, I get him to come and sit on my lap. I explain to him why I am saying no. You know, God explains to us many times from his word when he says no, why it is no. I explain to my grandchildren and say, son, this is the reason your grandpa is telling no. He will listen very carefully. Then he'll think, okay, thank you. And he'll go and play. You know, our problem is we are not willing to listen to God. Why he is saying no to us? We are not ready because we, for us, no is not an answer. And because of that, our relationship with God is an emotional relationship. When our emotions are good, when I pray and seek God, all what I re want, I receive, I'm so happy. I worship God. I praise God. I'm willing to be on the mountain to take the mountain and say, God, I'm ready to lay my life for you. But at the same time, when it takes us through a period of dryness, when it takes us through a period of disappointments, when it takes us through a period of difficult times, why? Because experience is the method God teaches you to serve him and love him because that is covenant relationship. In a contract marriage, when it does not work, they go for a divorce. That's the only solution the world has. In a covenant relationship, when the marriage does not work, the husband and wife will sit down and talk. Why is this marriage not working? And they will find ways and means to make a way for the marriage to work. And they keep going. Because in every marriage, in every life, there are challenges. I married 35 years. I'm saying it's not, there have been challenges. But those challenges have not destroyed us. It has taken us closer to each other. Stronger. Are we loving God? It's because uh, in a contract level or on a covenant relationship. Contract always says, don't trust the other party. So we live in a doubt and fear always. But covenant says, give yourself 100%. Years ago, uh, I'm a marriage, professional marriage counselor. A couple came to me, young couple. 
And that person said, I do my 50% and she does her 50%. I listened and had a slight smile. And when I have that slight smile, they know that smile is not a good smile. I do my 50% and she does her 50%. In covenant marriage, contract marriage is 50%. And that is why many families are going through crisis. Because 50% is not marriage. Covenant marriage is 100%. 100 give, husband gives himself 100% to the wife. Wife gives 100% to the wife. And as they give each other 100%, that is covenant marriage. Our relationship with God also same. We don't give God 50%. I don't tell God, okay, I'm reading the Bible every morning. I'm praying every morning. I'm giving my tithes every day. I do what I can do for you. Now you do for me. No. That is not, that is 50%. I bargain with God. We bargain with God. Our contract relationship is a constant bargaining with God. I'm doing you my part. You do your part. And when his part is not done, because he knows better when to do and when not to do. But he's God. If he can create you out of dust, out of nothing, in his own image and in his own likeness, he knows what to do with your life. Because God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, for my ways are not your ways. Your thought says, if I go on this path and if I do this, then I will be successful. God says, that is not the path I have ordained for you. His ways are not your ways. In common and relationship, we say, God, I trust you 100%. It's true you promised me. It's true you promised me when I come, came out of darkness that you will bless me. It's true you promised that you will bless my children. It's true you promised me these things will happen to me. But Lord, it has not fulfilled. But trust, I trust you still. I still trust you. I still believe you because you are God. Amen. God never changes. Yesterday, today, and forever, he is the same God. When he has promised, he will fulfill. Man will promise and fail. But my God, when he promises, he will fulfill it. Amen? Say amen with me. So if he has promised you to bless you, he will bless you. If he has promised you to promise, prosper, you will prosper you. If he promised you that he will lift you up, he will lift you up. If he promised you that he will make your life to be fruitful, he will make it fruitful. But in his time, listen, in his time and his way, he will do it. Our problem is we try to teach God. When you have covenant love, you say, Lord, it's your way. When you have contract love, you say, God, my way, which is better. My way can fail because my mind is limited. In covenant relationship, when you say, his, your way, God, his ways are so different, we don't understand. There are times you go through a path which you will never understand. There are times you go through an experience which you don't understand. Being in ministry for more than 45 years. I stepped into ministry at the age of 18. 19 I was in SABC. I celebrated my 19th birthday in SABC. I forgot it was my birthday till my friends came to my room and sang happy birthday. So much I enjoyed it. But I wanted to come to Bible school. I wanted to be what God wanted. What I'm trying to say is, he has never failed even one day. He has never let down one day. When I learned to trust God, I said, Lord, I don't want a contract love. I want a covenant relationship. I'm going to trust you 100%, no matter what happens in my life. I've gone through dark periods. I've gone through difficult times. Young people, listen. You might go through experience, you have a plan, you have an agenda, you have a plan, this is the way I'm going to prosper. But remember, build a covenant relationship and say, God, this is my plan, but I want you to do it in your way. Amen. You bless me. 
You take me through the way you want me to go. And God is faithful. And when you come to Mark chapter 12, Jesus speaks about a covenant relationship love. Covenant relationship begins with love. Love is the basis for covenant relationship. The love which Jesus is speaking is not an emotional love. The saddest thing today, a lot of people watch TV and some are so addicted to TV and internet. And the love they see in the TV and internet is lustful love. That is full of lust. You only receive, you don't want to give. And it's only temporary for a moment. But the relationship God wants you to build with him a love relationship, which is a covenant relationship, which is not emotional, but which is strong. It's something deep within you. Within you. And many times we don't understand. You know, sometimes I heard people, children tell you, and children do this. When the children ask you something and when you give as parents, they say, I don't see, I, I, you are the, one of the best daddy, you are one of the best mommy, all what I ask you, give me, I have never seen a father like you, I have never seen a mother like you, you are the best and you are, nobody else can be compared like you. Next day the same child comes and asks you, dad, can I have this? And you say no. The same mouth which he said yesterday you were the best daddy will tell today I have not seen a worse dad like you. You are not the best. You are the worst dad. You are the bad person because you have said no. The father knows the best. That is love by giving. I tell people don't spoil by giving everything what they ask. I always believed when I was in Bible school as a president, nothing is free in our Bible school. You know why? You don't appreciate. I tell our students, work and learn to pay. Even the tuition fees was no scholarship. You work and I pay for duty and they pay through their duties. I pay 150 rupees hour of work. That means 150 rupees hour of work is hard work. But you pay it, you appreciate, you study better. I just brought a team from Sri Lanka, a church workers team. I said, you, every one of you better raise your money and pay your money for the tickets. Why? Then you'll appreciate the team. They left last day before. Every one of them raised their money. Some of them are very poor workers from villages who have come and joined us. You know, sometimes we measure love by getting things, giving things, receiving things. That is not love. Love is not by giving and receiving. Only you give to receive. No, love is something difficult. We speak about God's love. When God loved you, he never expected anything from you and me. But he gave his life on the cross. And that is what we celebrate in communion. God's love. The love of God. He didn't expect. The only thing one he says is, he never, though you were in sin, though you were in unrighteousness, he still loved you. You had nothing to give God to receive his love. You had only a sinful lifestyle to give God. You had only a brokenness to give God. You had only all your failures to give God. But when you came to the altar and gave your life to Jesus, and when you said, Jesus, be my Lord and Savior, what happens? He showed his love by giving you salvation. We had nothing to give him, but he gave everything. And when you come to chapter 12 of Mark, this is a very small book, 16 chapters. And in this 12th chapter is a transition, the, the Sanhedrin council was very angry with Jesus. Because he condemned the form of religion without love. He condemned the religious leaders who had formalities and forms in their life, but inside them there was no true love for God. Their relationship with God was more of contract than covenant. So the Sanhedrin council decided to catch Jesus' words. 
in the sanhedrin council where 70 people were involved they are the pharisees the sadducees and the scribes they were the religious leaders who decided for the nation so first they send the pharisees to meet jesus in verse 13 then they sent to him chapter 12 of verse 13 then they sent to him some of the pharisees and the herodians to catch him in his words they thought jesus is doing miracles we can't do anything to dispute that jesus is people are with him because he is helping people people are following him only thing we can catch him by his teaching words so they send the pharisees and they come and ask him master should we pay taxes good christian good question for christians should we pay taxes and jesus is saying i'm cut, cutting down but that's not my message jesus is saying pay to caesar what belongs to caesar and give to god what belongs to god we have a responsibility to our nation give to the nation what we need to give them i tell my people if you have to pay taxes pay, pay it faithfully be a faithful nation person in the nation a citizen don't rob because if we rob the nation we'll rob god if you're faithful to the nation we'll be faithful to god so jesus said pay what belongs to caesar to caesar and pay what belongs to god to god they had no words to say then the second group comes in verse 18 then some of the sadducees uh, who say there is no resurrection came to him and they asked him saying now they are using the scripture again the moses wrote now these sadducees were people who never believed in supernatural things they never believed on resurrection and they're asking what is going to happen when one person dies and jesus explained they asked one brother was there he died he was remarried again this woman and then that brother died he married the second the same woman and this goes on for seven and now both are all are dead in heaven whose wife she's going to be there were seven husbands in the earth jesus says in heaven you're going to be like angels there is no husband and wife and they had no answers again and the third man comes to him in verse 28 the, one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together perceiving that he had answered them well asked him which is the first commandment of all now a scribe who was a teacher of the law he knew jesus has answered the two groups well now he is asking him which is the important greatest commandment and here jesus begins in verse 29 i want you to follow jesus answered him the first of all commandment is hear o israel the lord our god is the lord who is one hear o israel the lord our god is the lord one there are two things in this verse he tells to his brown he uses these words with the jews were very common it's called the sema then each time the jews pray they use this word the lord our god is one our god is one the jews believed in one god and he says remember first and foremost there is only one god in this world now how can we apply this to our lives anything that takes the place of god in your life god takes the second place if your job is more important than god your job is your god if your family is more important than god your family is god if your vehicle is more important than god your vehicle is god my friends god says there's only one god and that one god should take the first foremost place in our lives can i have amen, amen. i know it's telling amen is difficult but that's true first place is god are you giving god your first place you know sometimes we don't give god the first place we give the blessing the first place rather than the blesser who has given us the blessing 
Sometimes uh, as a child of God you make lot of promises to God you say God I will do this I will do that I will do this I will go this way and you do all that but then as God starts blessing you and as God starts prospering you you begin to say God you know I live in a society which is very competitive I have to have this kind of vehicle then people will respect me if I have come to this position in society people will respect me if I do this uh, i people will respect me so you know you god you understand because you are the creator of the world so god understand me you take the second place for a moment i will give my job the first place you start work at 4 o'clock in the morning or 5 o'clock in the morning and come home at 10 o'clock in the night you're so exhausted you say lord morning i will pray to you in the night by the time you come at 10 o'clock in the night you're so tired so exhausted you just a one prayer god bless me bless my family bless my children and lord amen then after some years your family is drawn away from you your children are away from you why love is relationship love is giving time in marriage in relationship with god you need to give him the first place give him time if the husband goes in the morning and comes in the night and has no time with the wife there is no relationship in the family and very soon the husband and wife will become strangers the father and children become strangers with strangers there is no love only to get the father thinks giving love means giving the children what they want good and bad they receive that is not love love is giving time to your spouse love is giving time to your children love your loving god means giving god the first place the most important time in your life learn to give god and then learn to love the blessings which god has given nothing will go wrong in your life nothing i'm not talking a theory i'm talking what i practiced in my life because i learned to give the important most important time in my life for my wife and my children after 35 years of married life my wife and i are friends we are friends we enjoy speaking we enjoy spending time together we enjoy only time we separate is on a sunday because we are preaching in two different churches only that where she also preaches but most of the time she is with me the reason she did not come today is i left at 5 o'clock in the morning so she said you go at 5 is too early every day i get up i go to my church at 5 in the morning so she said at least today let me stay with the grandchildren and children and go to another church my friends first place the lord your god is one if you want to have a covenant relationship give 100% your time and energy to god it's only then he will in return love you and bless you and lift you up and then he says and lord our god the second thing in there is is our god my god your relationship with god is a personal relationship your relationship with god is a personal relationship which you can not study from a book which you cannot learn from a conference but reading god's living word the powerful word you build a personal relationship with god and when you build that personal relationship what happens is you begin to trust god more and more in your life you know why we want to leave god and go in our christian walk when you go through difficulties because we don't trust him enough that he's able to get me out of that situation yes. there are times we put the, we create the situation in our life it's not god but we prob we blame god we blame god for every situation but most of the time every most of this most of the situation is we have created and then we blame him my friends he's your god there's one god your god can you get up in the morning and say god you are my god 
a personal relationship the closer you get close to god the more you spend time with him and build that relationship with him what happens you begin to trust god in your life day by day jesus said you have faith as the size of a mustard seed we all know what is a mustard seed what is tiny little seed but that faith with the size of a mustard seed has the power to say to the mountain be removed and that mountain will be removed in your life the problems can be like a mountain you cannot go around the mountain you cannot go over the mountain but if that faith which is within you which has size of a mustard seed when you have relationship with god you are able to trust god to move mountains in your life that does not mean you will not have problems that does not mean you will not have disappointments that does not mean that you will have not go through difficult times persecution but even in the midst of all that he gives you the faith and the love you have for him you can say mountains to be removed and it will be removed amen that is the covenant relationship god is speak jesus is speaking your relationship with him and that one god It's the most important thing. And then the next verse, verse 30. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And this is the first commandment. I'm not going to dwell much on this. But something I saw in this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. with all your soul with all your mind with all your strength is not 50% love contract love is 50% you do this i will do this covenant relationship is 100% that means you go to god 100% trusting him he comes to you trusting you 100% somewhere around the corner 50 50 no 40 60 30 70 that is the place you god meets you he doesn't want you to but when you trust him 100% and goes he comes down to meet you somewhere but 100% is important we need to love god with all our heart Amen. my heart is the most important thing you know when the heart stops everything ceases when you have a heart attack don't have a heart attack but when you have a heart attack and your heart ceases to start beginning to slow down and stop the machine starts showing it's stopping the doctors are not going to stand there and say oh i'm very happy the heart is stopping now oh this is good thing uh, the heart is not working no they will do all what they can i know some of the doctors will get into your body they'll break even one or two of your ribs hit hard for the body to heart to work and if it doesn't work even they will bring the current and hold the current into your heart to give you a shock treatment get that heart moving because as long as the heart is not working your body is not working my friends in our christian life our heart is our lifeline my heart should be working to love god 100% have you given your heart 100% to god you know sometimes i hear young people saying part of this heart is for my girlfriend or boyfriend part of this heart is for god you can't have half a heart for god and half for girlfriend and boyfriend Oh, half of my heart is for my wife your heart is 100% belongs to god and when you learn to love god 100% he learns to love you 100% is there a reciprocal god says learn to love god jesus that is what he said that is sacri- that is covenant relationship learn to love god with all your heart then he says all your soul your senses your being when you worship god learn to be expressive you know sometimes we think forgive me expression is weakness who said i love to shout i know when i was young my wife when i was, when I was 50 years old when i reached 50 now i'm 62 and now i can tell the age because when i was 24 i became the senior pastor and my assistants were 30 years and 29 so i never told my age at that time god raised me up so always they ask my age i said don't ask my age and thank god i had white gray hair at the age of 24 
That's a blessing. So I tell them, see my gray hair and don't ask my age. Now I tell them openly. I just finished my 60th, 60th birthday. And you know, sometimes we don't understand. God wants us to love him with all our soul. The entire being. When I reached 50, okay, when I reached 50, my daughter told me that I have advice. You know, daughters have a lot of advice for fathers. Dad, now you are 50. Now she was only 18 at that time. You are 50. You are old. You are not young. So can you, in that pulpit, all that galata you do, can you stop and be like an old man? I like to walk, I like to jump, I like to shout, I can't stay in one place, uh, putting me in a cage, is locking me up, uh, and I can't do that, uh, and I do all that. Uh, and she says, Dad, now it's enough. Uh, now you be more serious, uh, and more, don't do the, all that. Uh, I said, I'll try. Only one service I tried, uh, and I failed. <laughs> so I asked my daughter, do you want me to be a failure or success? She said, be a success. I said, allow me to be who I am, but I'm very careful now. But what I'm trying to say is, your soul reacts. When you worship God, let your soul express to Him. Say that you love Him. Don't stand and say, Hallelujah. Express to Him. If you're happy, say, Hallelujah. Open your mouth and begin to worship God. Because God dwells in the midst of the praises of His people. If God has to come down, His people have to open their mouth and praise God. I was in Australia a few weeks back and they wanted me to preach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the previous week I was in Sri Lanka, everyone who came forward, every young person and young adult received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. About 40 people received. So I was excited. I went to this church, preached. I said, worship God. I said, as long as you tighten your mouth, God can't use anything. You want God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. He wants your tongue. Open your mouth and begins to praise God. If you want God's presence to come down and His Shekinah glory to fill this place, don't keep your mouth shut. Open your mouth as Joshua and the people shouted as they walked around the Jericho walls. The walls broke, were broken the same way. When you begin to open your mouth, begin to praise God, begin to thank God, begin to worship God, the presence of God will come down. That is where you will have the victory. Jesus said, praise God with all your soul, with all your mind, intellect. Don't just say to God, I love you, I love you, without meaning. Tell God why you lo love him. Yes. Have a purpose in telling him. Yes. You know, sometimes like a parrot, we repeat to God and tell God, and we don't even mean what we say to him. God says, open your mouth in your mind. Understand. When you say, God, I want to thank you this morning. Why are you thanking him? Thank you for a good new day he has given you to live for his glory. Today is the first day of the week. And as the first day of the week, you have come to God's presence. Thank him. God, as I given you the prime time, first day of the week into the house of God. This week, I want you to be a blessed week. God will bless you. In your mind, understand. And finally he says, give, love God with all your strength. You know, we are expressive people. Spirituality is not being stiff. The very people who are very stiff, put them in a football stadium, put them in a cricket stadium, put them in a place where the crowd is excited, shouting and hooting and whistling, seeing the team winning, India is winning. Are you going to sit down there and look and say, oh, India is good, India is winning, I'm very happy. No, you are part of the crowd, what? clapping with them. If you can clap and praise and praise a team which is worldly, why cannot we express God and thank the king of kings and the lord of lords uh, and say hallelujah give me a shout uh, hallelujah hallelujah i like when my people respond i get my people respond a lot i say don't still sit, sit, sit stiff why god wants expression we need to enjoy the presence of god and then the next verse let me end with this he says and the second is like this jesus did not stop there you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
there is no other commandment greater than this that is covenantal love covenantal love will not only love you it will love your neighbor who's your neighbor the person who is working with you who's your neighbor who is in your home who's your neighbor who is in your college who's your neighbor who travels with you learn to love them let them see the love of god in your life and through that they will begin to glorify god my daughter is a lawyer just started working she's working in a firm there are three buddhist and the top guy is a catholic who does not believe in god few days back she came and said dad i need a singala bible singala language because one of the girls in the office wants to read the bible to see what it says and what is that tell me my daughter is not a great preacher but by living in that firm a uh, being a christian and showing the other girls love they want to know what does the bible say about this god has not called you to be a preacher i tell my pre- church all don't become preachers i won't have anyone to preach i'll have empty seats everyone will be behind the pulpit <laughs> right am i right all of you all are not preachers god doesn't want all of you to preach but god wants all of you to preach through your lifestyle love your neighbor show love to people the world is hungry for love the world is looking for love why young people are going after drugs is because of love why people are going after alcoholism is because of love why people are going after sinful way of lifestyle is because of love the world is looking for love and you and i who have the love of god who have the covenant relationship love it is that love that can reach to the world if you start living your christianity this church is not going to be enough to contain people right. stop right. preaching the world has heard enough of sermons i tell my people the world has heard enough of sermons sri lanka has had some good preachers we don't want any more preachers but we want pen and women under the conviction of the holy spirit will start living love their neighbor reach out to their neighbor and help them so that in times of need in times when they need something you reach out to touch them what happens they ask you why do you do it you know when we do community projects i tell my people we had lastly we had some disaster i was in australia when that disaster happened i called the church and said do something i said everyone who has something do something they collected they helped 75 families with food with different provision and the people asked why are you doing this they said i said don't tell them anything just do it don't preach but after some time they asked why we said because god has loved us because god's love in us we want to do it for you today i can walk into those communities which are predominant buddhist and hindu communities but as i park my car and walk into those homes they will tell me our pastor has come now i'm not their pastor why our pastor because of the love in action you are ready to preach stop preaching but live learn to live love your community love people around you love people who are lost in sin don't look at this man who's an alcoholic who has gone away from god who has gone away from life and family he has gone away because the devil has robbed him don't look at him and condemn him take time to go after him seek after him because jesus said we need to seek after the people who are lost in israel go after them show love don't preach show love some will take advantage let me warn you that also some will take advantage but that will be one in a 10 all 10 will not take advantage but nine will come back my friends today the world is looking that is why jesus is the greatest commandment is a covenant relationship when we learn to love god 
with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength, and then I will turn around and look at my neighbor and show him love. That is covenant relationship. Where I learn to do it, and when you learn to do it, God the Holy Spirit will use you to bring people into the kingdom of God. You might be one of the lousy speakers. I had a lady in our church, she was divorced nine years. No hope of coming together. But I always kept talking to them and saying, you have to remarry. They were both not married. The children were 14 and 12. As a family counsel, I kept on talking to them. But I said, you need to come together. Understood the problem, started solving the problem. And God helped, not me, God worked. His grace worked. They remarried after seven years of divorce. Officially. And today one of the sons is a pastor. In one of our churches and gone as a missionary. And this lady after she they married. Every Sunday when they come to church. They never came alone. Why? Someone who the vendors come to the house. They say you know we were divorced seven years. But now we are remarried. And what happened? You know come to church. She can't even pray in the church. Let me tell you, one day I thought she has a good tongue. She can speak a lot. If she starts speaking, no one else can speak. So I told sister, can you close in prayer? And I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. No prayer is being done because her tongue got so tight. She could not do anything in public. She can't do anything in public. But she can talk to people personally. Every Sunday, five, ten people, they started bringing. Why? Because their life showed they could love in their family once again came. They can we allowed the community and people started coming. This one family filled the church for the glory of God. Amen. My friends, that is what the world wants today. Shall you all stand together?